welcome to the pod. Ah, hello, Gary. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to reconnect after all these years. Isn't it? Total blast from the past. (laughs) So maybe give people a quick intro as to who you are. So I'm Jenny McGinn, and um, the reason I know Gary is because we went through the Launchpad program run by the NDRC, and over that period of time, I had run a couple of different e-com ventures with my sisters, and I suppose we'll, we'll get into that in a moment. And right now, I am uh, consulting and working with uh, lots of different small businesses um, and publishers. And again, we'll get into that, I suppose, later. But um, yeah, we were, we were run through the gauntlet in the Launchpad program together, right? Absolutely, and you, you kind of highlighted there when we were chatting about it, it was kind of a similar-ish vibe to now. Things were a little bit... Yeah, yeah, so yeah, so okay, right. Um, if we go back to 2008, uh, myself and a couple of sisters, decided to set up a blog okay and it was very much a hobby we were all in full-time jobs or studying and we're kind of spread all over the place and um we had come across wordpress but it was like really 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 like in its infancy stages um but we thought hang on a second this might be a nice little tool for us to stay connected with each other which it was, we decided to um, write about fashion because we had an appreciation for it. We didn't work in the industry, but we had an appreciation for it. And um, honestly, it was just a little bit of fun at the start, but uh, first mover advantage, um, there was hardly any blogs at the time. Mm -hmm. And I guess we enjoyed it so much that we invested a lot of time into upskilling ourselves across a couple of different areas. And we ran that over four years. So from really not having, you know, a bog, what a website was pretty much at the start to the end where we had like a content schedule and we had guest speakers and, you know, all of those like publishing and marketing tactics that are like totally de facto today. At the time, it was kind of like, wow, God, these girls are really self-organizing. And um, you learn by doing. You just start. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I honestly think that's the best way. Um, And especially if it's something that you're personally invested in. So um, by kind of the end of the four years, we had gotten a lot of press coverage. We had uh, worked with some cool brands on some interesting projects um, and we'd really professionalized what we were doing. But I think what was frustrating was we'd, we'd built up this great audience and i think anybody working in digital and marketing will know just how difficult it is to build an audience especially a really authentic really engaged audience and at the time this whole concept of like monetizing blogs um affiliate marketing wasn't even a concept back then and we just felt frustrated that all this work was being created and you know brands wanted to work with us but they didn't really want to you know financially remunerate us for the work that was being done and we thought look this is just taking up too much of our time and we're not getting what we're putting into it we're not getting out what we're putting into it but we felt hold on we've just found a way for us to all work really well together and we we definitely um discovered how to build audiences and we don't want to let all that go to waste so we're in 2012 now and the real ripple effects of the recession are starting to deeply impact the economy. And although that might send a lot of people, you know, straight into, you know, safety and security and hanging on to their jobs and um, doing whatever they can to just keep the status quo, we were like, will we just go for it? Will we just try and set up some something of a business like we didn't have a clear business idea but we're like we know we know we're good at working together we know we're good at building audiences and we know that we are looking for a commercial opportunity so can we just you know wrap all this together and see what we can do and we did that we we uh two of us quit our jobs uh one was just finishing college um so it was kind of a perfect opportunity for her so she actually quit to do it yeah 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 i know absolutely bananas um bananas just on that how did you make that decision because people ask that question a lot i get a lot of questions of people going i'm in a job how do i know yeah 
do it. <laughs> there's no, and there's no answer. I, I don't have the answer yet. Maybe you do. No, there is, there is no answer. But what I will say at the time, right, we had naivety and pure passion on our side. Also probably youth, you know, I'm a bit longer in the tooth now. Um, so I might do it in, you know, a slightly different way. At the time, you know, we weren't, we weren't letting go of our jobs and going, okay, let's sit in a room with a blank piece of paper and start from scratch. You know, we've been building this thing in the background for a couple of years. So that helped today. If I was going to do something like that, I think there's lots of advice around, you know, have six months of your six months salary saved up, have like a working prototype out in the market, have got like get some customer feedback, et cetera, et cetera. Like we didn't do any of that at the time, but we had something that we were working with. Um, but we, we, you know, we didn't have, funding lined up we didn't have the accelerator lined up we just said we're good at this we're good at working together let's see and to be honest at the time we might have gone on to achieve what we did if we had stayed in our jobs but I really doubt it I think sometimes you just have to rip the plaster off and do something that makes you feel uncomfortable because the minute you're uncomfortable you are going to work harder and faster you're going to be more determined and more focused and that's exactly what happened. We set ourselves a goal of three months over the summer to secure some sort of funding. We had a vague idea that there was going to be government support and grants around. And we just Googled how to get money from the business. And uh, we were so, so oblivious to the tech scene in Ireland. I mean, we didn't even know there was a tech scene. Do you know what I mean? We didn't know what an accelerator was. Um, we didn't know that there was this community um, and there was this movement growing in Ireland. But one thing that came up in our Google search was Launchpad. And um, to be fair, the, the hook for us was the funding that went with it. We didn't really understand or place as much value on the actual program itself. It was like, wow, here's X and money. And we were like, get that application in. And um, <laughs> it, was, it was fairly fairly fluffy now what we what we submitted it was something to do with you know a Facebook for fashion or something like that um but you know they 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 saw something in there and they and they thought okay this is absolutely ridiculous but maybe they have a, a good team or they've got a good audience and we can help them develop more commercial explain, strategies around that I lost that over so easily explain <laughs> that's a really interesting nugget that people won't know say that again Explain who your team was, because you kind of glossed. Oh yeah, that. sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah. The team, but explain who that is, because this is really interesting. Yeah, so it was myself and two sisters. I'm the eldest. I have the six girls in our family, so the the first three um, applied for Launchpad together. So myself, Sarah, and Grace. That's so unique. Like that's so so. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Like I could never work with my siblings. I know. And what's mad is of the six of us, five of us that went on to work together in wow. the, 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 the next venture after the, the launch pad venture. And we still, we don't all work together now, but we might as well. We all work in the same industries and, you know, we all help each other out. And I work with Grace quite a bit. So, yeah. And we went through some serious, serious shit and we still recovered from it, you know. So that's the thing. When you work with family, you have to get over it. Yeah, absolutely. So you went into the launch pad. I, just to touch on what you talked about there in terms of you figured it out. I think that's the answer is to start doing something. You know, don't just yeah. like wake up on a Monday and go, I'm out of here. And then it's there <laughs> whiteboard for like six days going, well, I like sports. Maybe I'll do something. <laughs> yeah. And now even, even like 2012, it feels like a lifetime ago now compared to everything mm. that's available now. Mm. Literally start a website this mm. afternoon you know, get Shopify going, get whatever you want going. It's unbelievable, like how easy it is. You don't even need that much tech skills anymore. Absolutely. The barriers to entry are so low and there's like all the tech comes out as well. Every innovation that comes out in tech, they just make it increasingly more user friendly. Um, I've just been going through loads of uh, Shopify workshops at the moment and it's just unbelievable. Like, you know, they're saying, you, you, why get a photographer? You'd like shoot your holy commerce store yourself we'll show you how and you're like yes literally you could set up an entire business over the course of a weekend and then you know do your job and do it well monday to friday and take whatever hours in between to um 
just keep testing and finessing and testing and finessing. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, we'll, we'll come to this later, but I think now is a really interesting time for people who are thinking about making a jump. I agree. Yeah, we'll definitely circle back on that. So yeah. go back to India or see what, mm. what happened next, I suppose, is the obvious answer. What happened next was we got the absolute sorry am I allowed to curse oh curse away <laughs> okay yeah, it's definitely not a <laughs> <laughs> we got the absolute shit kicked out of us oh my god I mean honestly we were like the country bumpkins bumbling into that you know what I mean <laughs> so obviously you probably have, have explained but you, you know it's a it's a, a program that's designed to speed up anybody looking to set up a business by um, setting them up with mentors across different industries, obviously key financing. Um, really critical, which we underestimated, was that peer-to-peer -peer learning environment, uh, loads of events, and um, obviously the end goal of that three months was to build a minimum viable product, get up and pitch it, and secure investment for it. Um, Just so. Like just like that, yeah. Like that. <laughs> um, and we 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 drank the Kool Aid. We honestly thought that that was going to happen. <laughs> by the liter. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, we we did really get a shock when we walked in because you know the caliber of people in there were you know like really really impressive. And some people were on their second or third businesses, or they've been you know twenty years working in a big tech company, and um like we had not even dipped a toe into the tech water. We were fashion, we were marketing, you know, we were publishing. Um, so we felt really overwhelmed at the start. And what I loved about Launchpad, and I will, you know, thank them for this a hundred times over, certainly during our cohort, there was so much emphasis on pitching, mm. you know, like literally you're all in there having your sandwiches and it's like, drop your coffees, go and pitch. Mm. And you're like, I haven't even like having strung a sentence together. It doesn't matter. The whole senior marketing team are going to be down here. Get ready to pitch. Um, I think that was the biggest scale that, that, that we got out of it. But um, amazing people. Um, a lot of people still in touch with, um, I'm still in touch with today. Um, and yeah, I, as I said, we went in with something really rough. Um, I mean, so rough, as you know, the, the story of us actually are doing our pitch to... to um, our, our competitive selection pitch to get into the program and um, we'd built a 3d model of the internet and you know to try and demonstrate what this facebook for fashion was going to look like with uh you know elements that you could move around you know to display the customer journey and Ooh. you know bits just kept falling off the <laughs> far more than we did <laughs> <laughs> But three PowerPoints. <laughs> oh, well, we should have stuck with the PowerPoints because, you know, the, the physical internet crumbled beneath our eyes. But um, anyway, it provided plenty of giggles when we were doing it. Um, but yeah, we had to get up and pitch straight away after we got in there, I think maybe on the second day. And it was just a shambles. I mean, it was absolutely horrific, like dropping pens, tripping over ourselves, like, you know, just giant uh, pauses and just apologizing the whole time. And I think after that, first pitch and sorry that was pretty much the whole of the management team of the NDRC I think after that we we're like right we are really really going to have to work very hard to just even bring our standard up to the rest of the groups in the cohort and um, we've got three months to do this and I think as I said it's it's just related to that whole just kind of throw yourself in you know when you're under immense pressure and when you put yourself under immense pressure great things can come and um that's what we did we just soaked up absolutely everything worked really hard like everybody else did you know and we did we learned a phenomenal amount um our concept evolved then from this very fluffy thing into like okay so we're definitely at the cross section cross section of publishing and retail and how and the customer is very much at the center of that so if we're great at building audiences and creating content to service those audiences and we want to really commercialize this for the long term rather than looking at you know affiliate marketing and redirecting and all of that sort of stuff why don't we actually build you know an e-com into the back end of a content platform and this sounds really passe today but at the time just it, people were not doing that so it did feel very um disruptive and innovative and all of that uh, so what we did was we built a brand called prowlster 
Um, the, the idea was that you were prowling around on the internet looking for cool stuff and the content was very much catered towards the particular audience in Ireland at the moment which was this huge unique burst of creativity and energy because of the recession you know when when the chips are down you really see this huge um, creative momentum so we were servicing content around lifestyle and hobbies and fashion and art and culture and um, critically with a shop built into the back end so basically you're reading an interview with a musician you can listen to the music uh you can read her interview and you can buy the shop or buy the dress that she's wearing straight off the page without having to disrupt your journey and um yeah we we because we were b2c as well we were really pressured to have some pretty high kpis that we needed to hit for our mvp and they seemed impossible at the time but we just got the head down and and we did them and I was really, really happy with what we built by the end of those three months. Um, we had a really strong audience again. We had about 15 retailers that we were working with. We got to see some really strong traffic and conversion rates. And um, yeah, we'd, we'd built a, a brand, which again, you know, is a very difficult thing to do. Building an audience, building a brand, two quite difficult things to do that people take for granted. And three months is a second. In yeah. We went in yeah. three months thinking, we're going to have yeah. a lot done. We're going to be finished handy. It goes yeah. by in the fraction of a second. Absolutely. Because you go in and you realize you know absolutely nothing. Yeah. And yeah. What you were working on is just a terrible idea. And you now <laughs> to just go back and refine it and refine it. And yeah. Using that word. Oh, the pivoting. Um, oh, the pivot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So yeah, it's to do that in three months is is a huge achievement. You're you're Just working at that, the speed of light. When you guys went in, it's so funny, perception versus what other people think. Remember, we looked at you guys and went, "She's not very polished. We're gonna have to <laughs> get, get better." So it's funny. You always underestimate yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I remember, I remember that conversation. Numerous people going, "Those girls are very polished. They really oh, have their shit gosh. together." And like, we need to start getting, you know you start presenting better like so it's funny oh, that is so you funny to yourself going yeah oh we're way up way behind yeah. I, think that, I think that's true though when you're starting off you think you're way way behind oh yeah you're, why would i start that idea someone else has already done something something like that yes yes and also gary now that we're so long in the tooth in the space the amount of bullshitting that goes on is unbelievable but you're but you're a little bit impressionable at the time so you, yeah. so you believe it all you know mm. one really really profound piece of advice i got um when i went into the first week um was you were going to get a lot of advice and a lot of opinions and the best thing that you can do is decide that you're going to listen to two or three of those opinions and graciously and gratefully listen to everything else but don't soak it up yeah you know you i say that with who you listen to everybody if someone asks me a question i'm like right first of all this is just my opinion and this yes is all the things that i think and i believe and i've seen and it's just my opinion mm -hmm. and i'm giving you like a little synopsis through my own lens of what i've seen so this is just don't yes. even think about it and then talk to 50 more people yeah and somewhere along there you'll see the threads but at the end of the day you you make the decision on what you think yeah yeah so true so true because as well i think when you're you know we really felt that we were out of out of our depth and I think, you know, when you're even in the space for a little bit longer or however far down that, that road you are in terms of setting up a business, like you are an expert in something for sure. Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes you're getting, you know, all of this expertise from like really well positioned, highly regarded thought leaders that it can be very difficult not to listen to what they're saying and just kind of shoot off in that direction because they must know because they have been 30 or 40 years in the industry. But of course, you know, you are the expert in what you do for a reason. You know, maybe there's bits that you don't have to hand. So one of the biggest challenges for us, and to be honest, I don't know how I feel and what I would say to somebody doing this over but we had to outsource all of our tech because we weren't technical we were creative we were marketing we were customer we were yeah. audience we were all of that stuff but we weren't tech and every venture that we um created through ndrc and after that we always had to outsource our tech and it was always the Achilles heel 
you Flat know, it cost. really was. Flat yeah. Um, we, we spent a lot of money outsourcing tech and um, didn't get the results that we needed. So, but uh, yeah, that's probably for the, for the, the failing story. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know the answer to that either. I think it's still the same story. Like I chat to people there starting now and they're like, that's a really good idea for X. I just don't have a tech co-founder. Where do I find them? And I was like, mm. if I knew that, I wouldn't be talking to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're little rare unicorns. I, I don't know. Like we we did the same. We we outsourced it. Um, Jennifer was very technical to a point. I was technical at all. John was technical at all. So we we outsourced a lot of it. And um, exact same as yourselves, we ran into all those problems because yeah, it's you know when you the minute you outsource something, you spend as long explaining what you want than you do actually working on it oh 100 percent. and also you're being charged for trying to explain what it is that you need and having that translated and you know that that kind of skills and knowledge gap and i'm not i'm not saying it's you know we all know that um technical development in ireland is a premium anyway it is very expensive but um when you have that kind of knowledge gap you know a lot of um mistakes and misunderstanding misunderstandings happen and they happen frequently along the journey and they're very expensive and it's you can't it's not really anybody's fault you know yeah yeah it's you a lack of, lack of experience for us anyway we just literally knew so little that we were like again like you said there we were just taking it all on board as gospel mm. oh we need to do that mm. Mm. Off in that direction and build that as well okay yeah remember, totally yeah <laughs> i always remember the day that i think i knew it was all fucked we had this giant pie chart <laughs> all the things that we did <laughs> there was of things in there and we did none of them we didn't even do one of them well a like hundred this is what it's, this is what it's going to be like it was a giant chart i like, don't even know what half that is i don't know what encoding video is like i don't even like yeah it's long. i think going back to your very initial point is just start with something you know mm. build that out and become really 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 mm. really good at that and mm. I think between now and then, the 2012s and now, the tech has advanced so much. That you Absolutely. Can the, all these no-code movements, all this stuff, you can build something unbelievable. Yeah, with yeah. The technology now. Totally, sorry. And absolutely, we were just very ignorant at the time. Like, I would not consider myself a tech person at all now, but I could definitely set up a Shopify e-commerce website. You know what I mean? So I think it was ignorance at the time. I've been told, oh, you have to custom build. Obviously, you have to custom build. You do not have to custom build. Oh my God, there's off the shelf absolutely everything. But, you know, sometimes you, you can make expensive mistakes and for us probably not having that technical um, co-founder or senior member to say, lads, nah, you definitely don't need that. Like, here's a simple solution. But um, I remember that with you, we, we had that exact conversation going, oh, this technical thing, like, oh no, what we do here, like, do we try to hire someone? Or, mm. And you don't have any money either. Like, mm, mm. Founder, unless you're getting a little wizard out of Trinity or something, like, they're not going, yeah. like, oh, you got whatever, 50 grand in funding, did you? Oh, that'll do me yeah. for six months. That'll hire yeah. me. For six <laughs> yeah, like, absolutely. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We, we went on um, then to have Opt, which was a much bigger venture and much the bigger. Same thing did you, no so were you in the irish times fusion program no okay right so so okay we we finished launch pads right and we stood up to pitch and we asked for our money and nobody Freaking nobody put their hand up to invest what and that weird as well i was like oh <laughs> put this into the giant money bag there lads whenever you're ready honestly we did everything they told us to and um yeah so that was that was like a whoa moment and um I think we had one part, maybe two part-time um, people working with us at that stage. And we were like, fuck, 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 fuck. Um, and I can't remember exactly how many months. I think it was pretty close together. But basically, the Irish Times were, were trialing um, a tech accelerator program in-house for publishing. And I suppose they were specifically looking at... Um, startups who had built assets that might work alongside some of the Irish Times assets. Um, so we, we, we maybe had about two months and we went into this program and there was no money, um, I don't think. And I think it was, I can't remember, I think it was maybe six months. So you could work from the Irish Times and um, you got access to all of their senior sales and marketing staff. And um, it was, I, I mean, I think they only had the one program. So 
that maybe speaks in and of itself. But for us, they were really trying to, first of all, when we initially pitched to get in, they were like way too niche, way too niche. Your audience is way, way, way too niche. And um, we were like, yes, but this is the proof of concept. We're talking about the tech. And they were like, no, no, your audience is too niche. Your content is too niche. So then they were like, it'd be better for you if you partnered up with one of the assets that we have here and strengthen you know, your overall audience and your overall content creation base. We're like, yeah, that sounds great. That sounds really good. Um, and as we progressed, they kind of highlighted and flagged that entertainment.ie would be our perfect partner. And we're like, oh God, I don't know. That's, you know, is that maybe mixed messaging? It's quite, you know, quite different audiences, quite different content. And they were like, no, 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 definitely. That's good read for you. And um, we had loads of conversations with entertainment.ie and we had loads of plans about how we were going to work together and how the two kind of platforms would be merged. And I, I can't remember exactly when it was, but we just had this moment one day in the Irish Times and we were like, Are, we're, we're not ad tech. That's not what we've built. That's not what we want to build. That's not what we know. It's not where we want to go. Like we have built a publishing platform with e-commerce functionality built in. And the place for us that's really inter interesting is this intersection between you know, the consumer and the content and the checkout experience. And they were kind of priming us to be like an ad, ad an advertising add-on. And we were like, no, no, that's, that's not what we signed up for. So um, two things happened then. We were like, okay, whatever we built is just too niche. And we need to build something with a much wider audience opportunity. And we definitely do not want to be going down a publishing advertising route so that actually gave us great clarity and we also met some amazing people in there that went on to become very important and strategic advisors and mentors so the irish times program was actually really valuable for us but it did draw bring us to the, the that question that no entrepreneur wants to face um which is will i just shut down this business that we have so we built Prylster, it was a registered business. Um, we had some staff, we had loads of contributors. Um, obviously we had the funding from um, NDRC and we had been going through the competitive start fund um, application process. And we built this audience and we built this brand. We were like, does this fit with trying to build a, a product that serves a much wider audience and a wider um, problem for people? And I think we struggled to make that decision for about six months. And again, now I'd say if you have an inkling, cut it. Like if you have an inkling of doubt, cut it, rip it off, just do it. But when we were back then, it was very difficult to make that decision. We were very clouded because there was an emotional connection to it. It was all this work that we put into it. People knew who we were and what we were doing and what we stood for. And, you know, it did. It took six months to make that decision. We, sorry, over that period, we realized that we couldn't just um, subsume this one brand into another brand. I'll, I'll explain what the concept was after in a second, but it just it wasn't going to fit. And um, yeah, we did labor that. And I, I definitely hold my hands up and say, like, I really struggled to let go of something that we put so much work into. But, you know, you have to think you have to think about the future. And it's like, stop stop obsessing over the work that you've done to this point if it's not working it's not working so just let it go um and so ultimately we did that and actually two major things happened we eventually decided to let go of Prowster and um we, we 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 put it out um into the industry to see if anybody was interested in taking it over and amazingly um Le cool at the time who now are no longer run, running but they were a, an amazing publishing kind of powerhouse for the indie sector in Ireland they took it over um which which was amazing for us because it was like validation that somebody loved this enough okay. to want to take it, it. yeah yeah it did make it a bit Just easier on that, Jenny, you know about, about shutting something down deciding to mm -hmm. move on mm -hmm. had you already something else in mind or were you moving to something else or how did you come to that decision because I think that's such a difficult decision everything you say echoes exactly what we went through as well so how did you get to that point where you're like no done yeah I think I think it was somewhere in that time when you know the Irish Times were really selling us as this advertising solution, and we had to like it. Just was so 
discordant with you know our thoughts and feelings and I think we just kind of sat back for a couple of days didn't really do any work kind of went away from the accelerator and we were like sorry but what is it like what is it that we love what is it that we aim to, to set out and what we really wanted to solve was the buyer's journey and all the friction that buyers still experience and they still experience today when they're buying something online and I think we didn't have a clear idea we were just like this isn't the business that we really wanted to create what we know is we have to like widen what whatever we go to do we have to widen it but we need to go back to the thing that we're really passionate about and we need to start stress testing is it a problem is it still a problem and if it is then this thing that we built isn't servicing that problem. So we need to go back to the start and start again. And there was no way by that stage that we were just going to say, okay, this isn't working. Let's go back to our jobs. Like we were like, we were on the entrepreneurial road, end of story. We just, I suppose if, 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 if you want to look at it this way, Prelster was the MVP to bring us to Opt, you know, and, and in terms of looking at it from a story point of view, it did make perfect sense because, um, uh, Prowlster allowed us to stress test just things around publisher um, e-commerce capabilities um, audiences and consumer behavior you know the shopper's journey online but what we built with Prowlster wasn't the right vehicle for that so I think you know maybe we were a little bit different and maybe this is where the family piece kick in because I think after winding down one business a lot of people would kind of retreat a little bit take some time to reflect maybe go back into a job but we just saw this as no we've 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 come so far we got something here slightly wrong but we have to go for it again and this is the real big push and what we did was really quite staggering if i think about it the ndrc said we were allowed to stay in the office for another year free of charge if we wanted to and we said no do you know what we haven't got a plan but we need to go and get ourselves an office. We need to have rent that we have to pay every month. Okay. We need to have an environment that we can hothouse ourselves and kind of just black out all the noise that, that we were getting and just crack out this next idea and find somewhere to bring staff and customers and everything into. So that's what we did. And again, it just goes back to this whole thread that I'm saying about putting yourself in uncomfortable situations and seeing what how you will respond and what you will do and like honestly there is nothing more terrifying and humbling than having to pay a landlord every month you know and it, it just took us out of that accelerator mindset and more into it okay between a real okay. business and an accelerator program i think the accelerator yeah. program gives you this false sense of security it's like college it's like totally you're in this little kind of bubble you're in year one of college and you're just all floating about having great crack meeting yeah. unbelievable people yeah but at some point you do have to graduate college and get a real job. You know, you do yes. have to win, pay yeah. the landlord, you know, pay your yeah. office. I've never gone back to an open plan office since. Yeah. That exact Interesting. Reason, mm, mm. That exact reason when I started my secondary service and after that, um, I paid for a tiny little shoebox. It literally yeah. barely fit a desk, but had its own door. And that was for me, the exact yeah. same as yourself. The exact, yeah. this is my space. This is my office. It might be, barely fit a chair and a desk in it with my <laughs> yeah. office. You know what I mean? Because it would have been easy to go back down that route. And as you said, the noise and just, I think that comes with a little bit of experience too. You kind of, sometimes when you start, you want that reassurance. You just want somebody to say, oh, that's a really good idea. You're on, totally. the, right track. You're on the right track with this. Keep yeah. going. Yeah. But, but I actually, have, it's funny you said that. I've your name written up on the whiteboard here and resilience written around it. Like that's, <laughs> <laughs> how... I don't know. You, you mentioned a couple of really interesting things there that I identify with myself. You're on that entrepreneurial path that you mm. didn't even consider going back to a job. What, mm. what, what drove that? Like you did, didn't even have a flicker of doubt. Yeah. And I, I have to say, you know, the whole question of what it takes to be an entrepreneur, like there has to be something innate, like, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have entered this process saying, you know, Oh, I was born to be an entrepreneur, but like looking back, there was just obviously that innate drive in all of us. And that's not to say that like, you know, you can't be an entrepreneur and then have decide that you need to take stock for a year or two and 
go back and, and get a job because that's very wise to do as well. But I think it's that combination and working with your family where we were all so passionate, we'd invested so much together. And I think the family bonds, there's just an extra little drive to 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 push you push each other to the next level. And we all knew, you know, even though at the time we were all again very we were disheartened we were so disappointed um we were so disappointed for the audience that we'd built for you know we it felt like a actually now sorry i am flashing back i felt like a massive failure at the time what 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 went on to become the bigger failure option was that was a real moment for us but yeah if i if i remember now it was it was really 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 disappointing and disheartening but we just knew that that wasn't the end, that that was just a part of the process that furnished us with so much understanding and so much knowledge and so many skills and so many connections. And we knew we had something, it just wasn't for Alistair and we needed to keep going. And yeah, it was, it was the sink or swim of, will we just say, fuck it and get an office and just go from there? Or will we just retreat for a little while? And I do, I think it's the innate entrepreneurial ship combined with this sense of family you know drive because because i was disappointed for my sisters they were disappointed hey. for us you know so very radical honesty i would imagine as well um, yeah probably because you can be brutally honest with each other whereas yeah. if you've staff or if you've you know co-founders yeah. it's probably hard to just sit down and spill it all out on the table spill out all your fears spill out where you're feeling it's very difficult because you're like, oh, you know, are they going to freak out now and walk away from this? Whereas totally, sisters have no choice. They're stuck with you. <laughs> That's it. You've nailed it. Like we could have like almighty blowouts, but you know, at the end of the day, we were going to have like a, you know, family birthday dinner in two weeks time. So we had to get it resolved <laughs> by then. So that I, I always, <laughs> yeah, fuck it. Um, no, I always felt that, that that was a real challenge for um, co-founders who were in family, like family has so many problems but there is that just sense of honesty and and loyalty and I guess you're right I was like how would you have some of these really really difficult really frank conversations with a co-founder particularly if you you were a co-founder a set of co-founders that maybe came together through like a hackathon or you know something like that where you really it don't know my mind. Yeah. <laughs> how they work it blows my mind to go in and build a business with three strangers I can't think of anything honestly I'd like to do <laughs> Particularly when you're starting out, you know, maybe after you've done like you're a bit longer and a bit more mature in the business world um, in the startup space. But I think when you're starting out, like doing your first or second business and um, yeah, working with new co-founders, co that's yeah. I always say as well, um, definitely you really want to put a lot of thought into your co-founders because it's a marriage. It it's is a marriage. You wouldn't it just, is. you wouldn't just, well, maybe you would, you wouldn't meet someone at a weekend and go, let's get married on Monday, you know, and you're like, oh shit. All right. Okay. Absolutely. All my future earnings on you. If you hedge my future happiness of yeah. the next five to 10 years of my life in a best case scenario. Yeah. Um, you said something really interesting there though, about um, the failure of um, Prowlster was just the MVP for Opsh. Mm. I think that's a brilliant way of thinking because mm. especially maybe not so much in Ireland anymore, but people viewed failure as that is it full stop. Close the book, book goes on the shelf, off you go. That's oh, it. Don't ever speak okay. about it. Don't ever consider it again. You know, you failed at it, you fucked up, you're no good at that. Never consider it again. Whereas that's a brilliant way of thinking about it because no businesses, very, 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 very few start, go up, retain the same structure, the same idea, the same, the whole thing, the whole way up. Usually it's up, down, stop, start again, up, go around that way and start again. And having that mentality, I think the resilience of, of that mentality is, is important for people to learn, especially now when things are going to the wall. A lot of people will go to the wall over this. Um, I think that's just reality we all have to face. Um, yeah. And it's having that mentality of going, yeah, that didn't work out. No biggie. On Absolutely. We go again. And you're right, Gary. I think it has changed a bit. I, I think maybe at the time around the accelerator phase when we were there, I don't know if it was recognized as much. And I think at the time you know, all you would see were these extremely edited, glossy success yeah. stories and there was no meat. And that's always a, an issue that I had sometimes going to big tech events 
you know, you'd, you'd founders would get up and, and it would just be this great, like pure kind of like beautiful free flowing story about how, how they became sex ones or success ones. Like where's the grit? Yeah. Like where's the failure? Start, middle, end. Absolutely. No story goes like that. No. <laughs> and it's always like the origin myth. I always laugh when you hear a founder stand up and give that exact pitch and you're like, I was in the bus and I just looked at it and saw an abandoned warehouse and I thought that could be the <laughs> art team paying them a thousand an hour came up with that six months later. Yeah. It's, it's bonkers. Like, it, and I, I think people are more willing, even podcasts like this, people are more willing to sit down and go, you know what? Yeah, we just make it up as we went along. Absolutely. It's just so, oh, people are so sick of those really sanitized stories. Like, and you know, no, tell us, tell us the first time that you had to fire somebody. What was that like? What about your man who, you know, did you over and stole all your shares? Like, honestly, and I think one of the reasons that for us, we, we acknowledged it as a failure at the time and a failure that we wanted to overcome was because I suppose we had a very, very customer facing brand and we had a very close relationship with audience and journalists and this and that. And it's like, we can't just climb under a rock and pretend nothing happened. Like yeah. we have to explain. What what oh my God, of course you do. But yeah. we had to explain it. And we thought like, let's just tell them what, what, what happened and what went wrong. And you know, that we're going to go on and we hope they come on this journey again with us. But this is really a stepping stone. And it is because like everything that we learned through Prowser is what we applied then to Opt. So it is like, it is, it's not, like it's 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 a truth what whatever doesn't work out on your first step is everything that you know you won't do on your second step so so really bring important from the journey into the next step so um okay we sat down and we we're like okay really really what is it that we know is a massive problem for the widest possible demographic of of customers that we intimately understand and it was this pain point of shopping online so we were sold this myth that, that shopping online is easier cheaper faster quicker more reliable yada 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 and the reality was so far from the truth you know if we just take a typical woman who for example wants to buy an outfit as she would as she was walking down a high street in real life she might have you know six seven eight different retailers that she's going to go into to buy different parts for outfit why was that not recreated online? You had to go to multiple different stores, set up multiple different accounts, order different products with different shipping prices, different delivery options, different sizing, um, different um, user experience, different journeys across the site, you know, um, shipping information displayed at the start of one journey, not displayed until the end of another journey. Um, you know, and having to go through that process every time that you went to a website, like looking for a pair of, you know, black skinny jeans or whatever it was that we were using at the time, even challenging a woman to do that across 10 different websites servicing black skinny jeans. Each experience was completely different um, and very, very frustrating. So, we just thought, look, we know women, we know fashion, we know buying habits, um, we know a lot more about e-com now at this stage. Why don't we try and solve this idea? And we'll solve it in the demographic and the audience profile that we know best, but then we can replicate it. But it was having a single, basically a universal shopping cart, a single checkout account for all of your high street retailers. Um, so a single place where you could go and buy across all the different retailers with one um, account and one checkout. Critically, we never wanted to hold stock. We knew that from Prowlster. We didn't want to have anything to do with the operational side and the manufacturing side of the stock. We just wanted to really apply a much more sophisticated, frictionless layer of um, digital technology over that very, very distorted um, and fragmented shopping experience online. And then on top of that, again, we wanted to apply all of our branding and editorial and curation knowledge so that essentially a shopper would go to a marketplace that was, you know, curated around their tastes, their interests, their reference points, their sizes, their shipping prefer um, preferences, delivery preferences, et cetera, et cetera. So creating a nirvana for women that were shopping online. And as we were developing out that idea, shopping 
online men's shopping online as a category was growing at an even faster rate than women so we were like amazing we'll nail this then we'll move into menswear and then we'll move and then we'll move and we again had to build a brand to develop this concept but this was something that we were aiming to build as a successful global brand in and of itself but also very cleverly and again we learned this from office there was elements of the way that we were building out um some of the tech and some of the you know pathways and the way that we were um i suppose integrating with different platforms and publishers we knew that there was different elements of this that we could then sell on um you taking your experience i think that's the key thing is also to totally take experience with you and just hone it as you go don't just like yeah put it in a box discard it. oh that didn't work all right okay on we go yeah yeah no no we took so so many learnings so we learned um we obviously there was a couple of things that we knew how to do and we, we brought that with us um we learned that we needed to go out on our own so no more hand holding. We, we very much learned who we needed to listen to and who we needed to talk to and who we needed to get advice from. Um, we knew sort of how to start hiring as well, like who to hire and when to hire and I suppose how to hold off on hiring until it was really, really needed. Um, so I, we, we definitely learned a couple of things about what way to structure the roadmap of the business from everything that we didn't do correctly in Prelster. Um, so. So yeah, so that was a little, little tiny office on Stephen Street up like six flights of stairs. But, um, and the, the, the meeting room was right beside the toilet <laughs> and it was like a separate room that had enough for four desks and we fit like seven desks in it or something. It um, was it was ours and it was the start. Yeah. So what, how did Ops go? What was the kind of journey there? The journey was phenomenal at the start. Um, I think a lot of our cohort as like a, maybe the, the the accelerator infrastructure that we come from i think they were quite doubtful about it because we were going out on our own and um we'd really kind of said no look this is something that we need to do by ourselves um i think there was a lot of black marks against what we we're doing because you know sisters fashion um e-commerce they weren't the hot topics for like e-commerce um, enterprise ireland funding um it goes through waves it goes like, yeah. yes, it was like do not for the temptation someone's asked me oh what what will i start my podcast about i was like whatever you sit down and have a pint with someone and chat to them for two or three or four hours on don't jump on to something because it's hot or crypto or <laughs> keto or whatever yeah. whatever's the yeah word, whatever yeah the top google searches this six months don't do that unless by some coincidence you've been plugging away for 10 years in the dark about it and suddenly you're now the market expert which can happen too in that case great but don't just go off and try retrofit yourself into like a box so like what you're doing made total sense but there is a there's a bias there's definitely a bias as in yeah. this six months these investors are looking for crypto yeah can totally you bar, i remember we were someone told us can you just crowbar a bit of like i think it was ai at the time i remember pre, pre can you just make it make a bit of ai in there <laughs> like yes a, oh hilarious <laughs> hilarious like, pal do you know it's just you know, can you just make it sound like it's an ai project and you're like christ and and that's so funny because that's exactly what happened to us with prowlster and and you know then we realized, hold on a second, this isn't a business now anymore that has real legs. Like this is a business that could work as a partner in this environment for, you know, a, a definitely a shorter period of time, but we want to build something bigger and wider and global. And that's why we went out in the round because we were like, we cannot take any more advice of adding this or Y or X or Y or Z because we're going to go around chasing our tails. And, you know, the, <clears throat> the whole funding process for competitive start funds, Sorry, I'm going to cough. Okay. <clears throat> um, like, there's, as you say, like, it's definitely something is hot this year or like there's a strategy where they have to be sourcing and securing and promoting certain, you know, certain SaaS products or this or that. And I think if you go chasing that, mm. you're forever chasing funding and you're forever chasing at somebody else's you know request and behest zombie well, companies they just go from one funding round to another there's people that started with us jenny that are still knocking through the old hpsu startup funding they're still knocking around accelerators 
it's just oh like my God. living like vampires living off the little funding rounds that they get 50 grand here and 20 grand there and five grand there and oh they're pitching <laughs> a competition and they're getting all this funding and it's just going nowhere like it's going nowhere it's and, and like it's very the fun money life. All the money that you get, it's like, it's, it's, um, how can I describe it? The type of funding that is available in Ireland, it's like, it's enough to give you a taste, but at the same time, yeah. you're, you're in a noose, you know what I mean? Yeah. You're in a chokehold, like, you've there's only so far you can months. go. You've bought yeah. It three months, and yeah. It's a hard stop at the end of three months. I remember we were doing all the same stuff as you, applying to all these things. I was literally one person's full time job, but we did that as well. We fell into that trap as well. We, we were chasing exactly what you said there and that was what what killed us in the end we just chased and i talked about the big the circle we had of all the stuff and we were just crowbarring stuff in there a bit of ai a bit of machine learning you know can you automate this can you automate that and we just did it because that's what we thought had to be it's like i think of it as like clickbait on youtube can you have that in the title because if you have that in the title, that's going to come back a little bit better absolutely I'll back into the convo there <laughs> oh my God. Uh, yeah, all we knew as well, as you did, is the, the, the anecdotes going around was that it didn't matter what you applied for, for CSF, you had to apply at least three times. No, no. You weren't going to get anywhere unless you applied three times. So all, all the old wives tales. Yeah, no, we heard them all. I remember we applied for one funding source. I won't say what it was. And we went in and pitched and we applied to a board and there's three on the three on the board. And uh, one guy was very relevant to us. Got it. One guy owned a fish farm. <laughs> <laughs> the other woman, I, I think she, I can't remember what she did, but uh, I remember getting a phone call after a man. I remember distinctly we got office space at MDCU. Um, we got our own office. It was great. They gave us our own office for like a summer, kind of like what you guys were thinking. And I remember uh, we got a phone call after, after a man. Some intern was like, uh, just letting you know, didn't get the funding. I was like, right any feedback on why no i just said you were number 16 of 15 so you'll get (laughs) time and i was like oh my god buddy i'll save you some time we won't be around in three months so (laughs) we won't even have another process but it's that kind of stuff and that's the silliness and that's kind of the lesson learned is always standing on your own two feet you know whatever business i do in the future has to fund itself from day one or more or less or have access to outside funding because stuff like that it's it's a you have to clear you have to clear the launch very quickly you have to get into orbit very fast yeah don't yeah. get stuck in that little kind of like ups and downs you're just bumping along and the atmosphere. yeah never getting into that trajectory of like okay now we can sustain and now we're on our own path and we're not yeah. reliant. the minute you're reliant on someone like you said there it, it, it's a very different just different conversation because if you're reliant on someone and they're saying oh jenny you need to be you know you need to be an advertising play and you're not don't want to be an advertising play it's awkward the conversation changes you might find yeah. some that were there before are no longer there now yeah, absolutely and the goalposts change and yeah it's and your relationships in terms of like the power dynamic as well like all that changes it, it gets very complicated and confusing and i that is my biggest learning gary going forward is no matter what you're doing you need to have a way of generating revenue from day one it doesn't have to be huge revenue but you need to be able to sustain yourself when the chips go down because the chips will go down at some point the funding processes in ireland have like evolved over time but there's still just a bit of like witchcraft about it you know like relying on that so there's amazing grants now but when you are looking at the roadmap of building your business and there's kind of a sort, certain formula in ireland you know you apply for this you apply for that you apply for this you get here you get that if you're relying on that journey you may successfully go through that journey but it still leaves you exposed when you get into the next phase of your journey which is when you're really looking for you know series a and the big round of external funding um and you're kind of almost first of all you're trained to, to think in this way. We have to be dependent on this money, but um, you're, you're hamstrung from the get go because you've taken in all this money, you know, to get your business to this point of taking in this next round of lots of money. And all of a sudden you've got lots of different competing stakeholders. And anyway, I suppose this is ultimately what happened with Opt. But it, I, the, the process was we did, we got CS, we actually, no, we got a um, local enterprise board priming grant. Um, which covered us for about six months and um, 
we then got the a competitive start fund. So that gave us a little bit of kind of local that 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 running around money to to again build the proof of concept for Opsh. And um, I think we were really focused this time. We had six months, and we we're like, okay, by Christmas. So this was around February, um, February March. By Christmas, we have to have the results of first of all, we have to have approached and outlined our investor strategy, explained what we were going to do and what results we were going to achieve with our MVP. And then when we had uh, achieved those, what we wanted from them and when we would need it. So that was, that was really challenging having those conversations and identifying investors and having all of those, Oh my God, the investor circuit and the investor roadshow. But doing that while we were trying to draw down all the grant money as well, you know, by a slow process and then start building out what we needed to build. So what we needed to do was get the platform built, mistake number one, custom build, not necessary. But anyway, that's what happened at the time. Took a really long time to do that. Then um, we had to start building a brand to start developing an audience because so we were two sided B2B to C. We had to start building an audience. We know product. We had to start um bringing in and locking in retailers but we know audience so thank god we had some brand building skills because we built up this brand opt with absolutely nothing to say for it and nothing to show for it for about six months but we built up enough of an audience that when we went live we managed to secure some pretty big high street retailers to come on board for the trial period and we had enough of an audience to to generate those proof points and those kpis that we needed to hit um but that year was absolutely crazy talking to local governments and managing the local government grants and managing those relationships and then going out to invest whilst building out the tech, whilst trying to build a brand, whilst trying to convince retailers. Now, going back to my kind of credentials, we never worked in retail. We didn't have a network of retailers that we could pull from. You know, we had an appreciation for fashion, but it was really our understanding of the customer that we got intimately so everything we were building from new we were building new tech relationships new funding relationships new investor relationships new retail relationships and honestly it would start from like cold emailing and cold calling and it was just persisting until we got to have meetings with the right people and we got a lot of no's and then we got a lot of people who were like i like your chutz stuff i like it honestly like it was as as, as simple as that you know we, we kind of identified say in terms of approaching retailers we'd identify like the chief innovation officer if there was such a thing um or the chief tech officer so like we knew somebody in a big organization would either be tasked or certainly have an interest in seeing kind of new technologies or platforms unfold and that strategy eventually got us to have meetings and eventually got us to have i think lifestyle sports river island house of fraser and i can't remember who the other one was come on as as trial retailers and from from going from a cold position of having no contacts in retail that was pretty good i think this is an unbelievably good point for people and i just want to emphasize it is that don't sit back and think oh yeah well people are going to flock to us it's an absolute grind you oh, have to go it. out and don't just send one email don't just like oh hello we have this fantastic product yeah here you go like you will have to grind and i don't think anyone wants to hear that i think there's an element of because there are businesses you can just bang up now and you get a website it kind of takes itself off straight away you feed into like the amazon network or something people have this kind of like passive income mentality yeah 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 so i can just start my business and yeah surely you know i'll tip away do a couple hours a weekend yeah. It's a grind. If you're building something big, it's a huge grind. And understanding that sales process, I think, is a key factor. And yeah. I have someone who's worked in sales at some stage. And sales used to be a dirty word. I used to hate it going on. I used to think of all those horrible kind of, yeah. you know, smile and die. Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, five minutes to talk about Jesus. You know, it's, it's just, <laughs> it's awful. Like, whereas I think what you guys are doing is building the brand and building this, this community. It makes the sales process very much different because you're showing this is our value this is what absolutely we're, this is what we're bringing to the table we're not just yeah you need to take a punt because no one yeah. wants to take a punt no chief innovation officer got a raise for taking a punt on an unknown startup you know totally it's people got fired for it no one got no one got a clap on the back it's yeah they will want to see 
what are you going to do to make my life better? Yes. Make me money, preferably. Or save me money, Don't yes. Give me more work. That's yeah, the biggest yeah. thing. No one wants to go, oh, I've got a great new project that's going to take up 10 more hours of a week because no one has that time. I think people forget that. People think you get so in love with your own project that you think, yeah. surely they'll want to get involved. You know, yeah. Surely. Oh you my know, God, such a good big point. Projects have yeah. these big companies of loads of people just floating around, willing to be like, Drag, dragged into this yeah girls no one wants that so oh give them an unbelievable like there's only an answer is yes Go on. yeah nothing to lose here zero that is so true because do you know what people don't even have time to even hear and listen to your idea in the first place so you start you know trying to sell them something that's half formed and not very well thought out and actually a miss a misplace for their brand or you know you are dead in the water and I totally agree with you I used to hate sales and had all those like really old-fashioned notion of like the door-to-door -door salesman mm -hmm. and now I absolutely love it because it's about building relationship it's about as you say demonstrating that you have built something of value to somebody that's really going to make their life better and we had to sell everything everywhere all the time because we were b2b and we were b2c and we were you know the three strikes like unpopular profile for investment if you like certainly in ireland so we had to constantly sell there we had to constantly prove ourselves to like all the local enterprise fundings and grants I, there was just a real mistrust about our capabilities um and we just kept going and going and going and going and we had to learn everything that year as we were doing it and again you know just that hunger to get out there and do it as quickly as we could and to try and do it right. We were just constantly learning and learning. And, and you're right, we, we actually built a really slick sales process for our target customer, which were retailers. You know, they were the ones that were paying for the platform and the solution ultimately um, over that two year period. And by the end of it, we had 30 to 40 retailers signed up maybe i don't know 35 percent of them were paying full retailer tenancy fees and to 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 be tr and they were sorry they were mainly uk retailers we only had yeah. one or two retailers because we were targeting the high street we we're targeting the multinationals so that was a real achievement um for us and again with the with the audience we built up like we've been really good at building up audiences, but the, the targets that we had for the audiences that we need to build up for our investment were like multiples of figures that we had previously, you know, worked on and been comfortable with. Um, so it was, we, okay, let's, let's go back to the MVP. We know, we knew what we wanted to set out. We knew what we needed to achieve. And we did that. And we did that really successfully over the course of that year. I, I will say that we went out and we met with lots of um, Irish VCs not an interest not even feigning an interest like couldn't be more disinterested you got in the room but then when you got in the room there was just no interest no interest happy to meet us you know because we were kind of like this like side gig like oh three sisters oh, in fashion oh how exotic so we'll take the meeting <laughs> but um all I know about fashion now is my wife does like to buy things online. And actually, my 17-year-old daughter, she does shop a lot. So, yeah, this is what she does. But I don't think there's any money in it. And you're like, really? right, okay. Anyway, so look, we, we, we quickly said, look, there's no money for, her, for us here in Ireland. They're, they're e-commerce e um, and, and female-focused products. Like, they're just not, there's, there's not an appetite for it yet. The market isn't mature enough for it yet. So we knew, along with all of our customers being UK-based, pretty much our investors are going to be based in the uk as well so all of a sudden you're taking your investor roadshow and you're applying it to the uk and again like no contacts the first contact that we got was like like my dad's friend who met a man in a pub who said that his son was setting up something to do with money over in the uk and <laughs> would would did we want to get his email and that's how it happened we emailed him we met him and he turned out to work he, he started working with us on our behalf as an investment um, advisor and he set up loads of meetings for us one way then we also cold called and and just insisted until we got meetings and we uh, set ourselves up with a few networks over in the uk like some the h band and uh, not the h band network the irish what's that the british irish british IIBN, is it yeah yeah in there another female founded um network and we did, we specifically joined those networks to meet investors and then 
the last thing we did was we applied to the Microsoft Ventures Accelerator Program over in the UK. And that was very strategic. We wanted to be in a UK environment, in a UK community. We wanted the tech stamp of approval from Microsoft for our platform. Nice, yeah. And we, they were a lot more advanced when it came to e-commerce and retail. So they actually had this huge network of people who were doing really innovative things in um, retail. So very, very strategic reason to join it. And we got so much value out of it. But all along that journey, every, every part of that process of joining a network or applying for an accelerator it was all to do with trying to find an investor. And in the end... The investor that we eventually got in front of was so left field and absolutely not who we thought we were going to secure investment from. He was a private ultra high net worth individual. He was a board member of the Arcadia group. And again, I think he ended up being like, you know, the, this, the very first guy that we met, he was like, look, total long shot here, but I think I have somebody who knows somebody else who knows somebody else who may be interested in having a meeting with you. And, um, we couldn't set the meeting up for ages because he was in the Caymans and then he was in Mauritius and then he was here and he was here. And we were like, oh, lad, well, there, no problem. <laughs> what is this about? And um, we eventually got to have the meeting and, um, you know, honestly, like just if you can imagine a multi, multi millionaire and their office and what that office might look like, you know, when like a man right in the middle of the city in London. It was like black lacquer everywhere and like red velvet curtains and, you, you know. Billions or something like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But he was like, <clears throat> he, he was from a retail family, but he didn't specifically work in retail. And he was just like, I think you, you've got a good idea. You've got a good vision. I definitely think the space needs to be disrupted and I like your energy. So, awesome. yeah. So uh, the team dynamic does go a long way. So yeah, we had one meeting with him and he put in a chunk of money. Wow, from one meeting. And from one meeting and just the, all of the months that we spent trying to secure that in Ireland, like it was unbelievable. So that was absolutely amazing because two stamps of approval, retail family, chunk of money. But then we run into another problem, which is we want to get HPSU match funding in Ireland, but they were like, you didn't. There's no way. Sorry, what? You went to the UK and found an investor on your own and he's putting in that amount of money no no we don't believe you so we spent ages trying to convince them what was happening and how this happened so yeah that was a really frustrating experience as well <clears throat> and uh they they tranched our money um which again was was really frustrating because it's like you know we're we're out of that startup bubble now we're on to what that means because i think a lot of people don't understand that this is very common in yeah. uh, investment rounds that it does it's not like win the lottery you don't get a big bag of eight million yeah, yeah. what happens in cases like that so so first of all the third party investor um ultra high net worth investor he had a lump sum and he was just happy to put it in straight away next week in fact like they i suppose one of the benefits about uh, approaching ultra high net worths is they can move so they're slightly different from angel investors in terms of you know they're not part of bands and they're not throwing in like 20k or 40k or 50k they'll put in significant amount of money and they can move really quickly <clears throat> but generally what um you know government funding structures look like is that the money can be tranched so let's say they're going to give you x amount of money and they'll put it in over a period of 12 months in two rounds based on milestones which is absolutely fair and i completely agree with that uh, to a certain degree but it depends what stage of the business that you're at and if you are in a stage where you need to grow 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 i think being held back by having to like disrupt that year spent by spending time filling out forms, filling out applications, having meetings after meetings after meetings, you know, waiting for period, like large sums of money to be drawn in. It can really, really kill cash flow. It can really kill momentum. And critically, it can really distract the founder's attention because they're doing all of this like admin. But also, for us, the goalposts kind of changed along the journey in terms of like what the KPIs were and how they were going to be released. So one thing that happened was um, 
the investor put all of his money in at the start. And as we were looking for the second round of um, tranche funding from Enterprise Ireland, we were told that we needed that tranche to be matched as well. And we were like, sorry, what? But the whole amount went in, you know, at the start. You know, they were like, no, sorry, it's a, it's a, you can think of it like a new round of investments. You're going to have to get a new round of investors. So that was in the middle of that year. And that year was absolutely critical for us. So what we'd agreed um, with the investor, with all of our stakeholders was, over this 12 months, this is what the money was going to get for us. We were going to build X of the platform out further. We were going to hire X amount of people. But critically, we were going to achieve 100,000 um, signups and aim for 30 retailers to be on the platform. And that they were the KPIs for us to, to then go on and secure the second round of investment. But we were massively then disrupted in the middle of that year by having to chase down the second tranche of investment and all of a sudden this kind of goalpost changing of having to find another external investor um, and eventually we had that resolved and um, we did get the money drawn down but that could have literally killed the business we kept That's going point have been self-reliant yeah exactly 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 so um now, by this stage, we were, we, had, we were working with three different contracted agencies, building out different parts of tech, key parts of the tech. We had an office on Leeson Street. We had about uh, 16, 17 staff. Um, okay, yeah, so. yeah. And we were like everybody, everybody in the team, like from, you know, senior product manager right down to the intern. Everybody knew what the goals were, what we were trying to hit, when we needed to achieve them. And everybody had the heads down and was just focused on smashing it. And we did. We, we said we were going to secure these KPIs by December 29th. And we hit them sometime around mid-November. So we absolutely smashed it. But again, we spent a lot of that year, you know, talking to investors, having a lot of meetings, talking to Enterprise Ireland. And then we had to go back on the investor circuit um, again, at the end of Christmas, going into New Year to get the second round of investment. And our investors were like, great, you did what you said you would. We're happy to go in again. Uh, but obviously, we needed to find somebody else because this was now a much bigger round of money that we were going for. I think we were looking for six million. Wow. And okay, I was going to ask you, are we talking hundreds of thousands? Or are we talking millions? Okay, six million. So that's, that's chunky. Yeah. Yeah, I think we were looking for six million originally because we had a lot of a lot of people around us who were like, okay, this is the moment, strike when the iron's hot. This is when you need to invest shitloads of money in marketing. You need to grow, 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 and get there as quickly as you can because this thing is gonna be massive. And we went out to the market looking for six million and we had all of this like this amazing case study and amazing proof points and the caliber of the investors and yeah, yeah, yeah. But Brexit was mentioned for the first time. I knew there was something coming. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. the movie and you're like, I, tell, I just feel there's something not going to happen here. Yeah. No, something not going to happen. So and you know as well, Gary, it came out of absolutely nowhere at the time for us. Like it came out of nowhere. Time, when it was mentioned, it was like, oh, imagine. I remember yeah. having the exact same conversation with it. Oh, like when I look back on him now, the lad was a genius. He was a very big property investor from the Far East. He was a client of mine and I remember having a chat with him over a coffee and he'd done a deal to buy a whole block of apartments in Dublin, 30. And uh, he turned it off that morning. He literally was like, no I rang them up and said, nope, not taking them, turned off. And oh third apartments, I think they were like about half a million each at the time, maybe 250 to half a million each. It's like, he just literally was like, yep, this wow. will cause a ripple effect throughout Europe. And this will go on for years and years. And this was ooh, very early, probably around the time that you're talking there. Yeah. He just had said, right, this is going to be, if this happens, this is enough. Even if it doesn't happen, he's like, this is enough to shake everything to its core. And, and, and that's it. And actually, it's interesting that you say, because it's the, 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 I suppose the caliber and the cross-section of investors and investor groups that we were meeting over there, you know, we were meeting some further ultra high net worths who then had their own kind of smaller investment company and investment profile. There was a couple of people that we met that were in property and absolutely, as you said, they're like, not sure what's going to happen, but feeling uncomfortable and not sure about the market. Um, now we did still have some people lined up who were like, no, we're, we're happy to go in. But what happened was 
meetings started to be pushed out um conversation started to be longer um just the momentum was just starting to shift totally totally so down. so then we remodeled and we were like okay let's ask for less and see how that test the appetite there and that is a really difficult thing to to manage because like you're doing it because you're thinking you will have more success if you do it that way and you know as well you know as as an entrepreneur that you can do a significant amount with any amount of money if, the, if that makes sense right so like always i think really get with the business needs you can cut your cloth you can cut it either way someone gives yeah. you a well that's fine that's what you're yeah. going to work with yeah Whereas, yeah but it's difficult for you guys i think you're on a trajectory there and you, the genie was out of the bottle in essence in one way yeah exactly so so we thought look we'll go back and we'll we'll look for a little less money um and see how that works but then that started confusing people and it was mixed messages and you know well as well as you were are you, are you yeah. sorry are you not are you you struggling now and yeah exactly and blood in the water yeah and when are you going to be able to hit these kpis and these goals that you're setting out um and so that we just kind of had to stop and think for a little while and decide what to do and i mean we still had a, like investor number a original investor we still had three other investors lined up but we needed a sizable chunk from somebody else and those groups of people were just starting to get really antsy and really nervous and just some of the conversations now again we're starting to move into and would you not think about going down this direction would you not think about going in this direction we're like oh my god here we go again yeah. um so what we did and i it goes back to an earlier point that I made about knowing when to stop. This was a million times harder. We did it in a shorter period of time, but in that period of time, we worked nonstop. I mean, literally 24 hours, everything we could. How can we get cash flow into the business now? How can we start generating revenue now? Will we look at pivoting now? What other external money can we get into the business? What if we did this? What if we did that? Like just A-B testing every single scenario that was possible. What if we take out a further bank loan? What if we let go of staff? And in the end, we did almost everything that we could to the business in terms of having to let people go, which was, I'm like, I'm a big people person. So that was, for me, the most difficult thing to do. Um, look at every conceivable type of emergency finance slash like trying to change the business model. And I think pivoting is always, you know, it's part and parcel of any business. But I think when you're trying to pivot from, a, from an emergency situation, like it's just, it's never going to, to, it's not never going to work, but I think what you had was that weird Brexit uncertainty at the time and then a business that had like it was you know we were reasonably public and we had a big profile and there were so many people behind us and at this stage was, we had so many different stakeholders and there was a lot of awareness for what we were doing and I think lots of people wanted us to succeed so you've, you have all that and then all of a sudden you're like oh god this is not like each day the runway was just you know, getting smaller and smaller and smaller to succeed and fight our way out of it. Success in a way, because you, you'd been so successful and grown so quickly. You now had this juggernaut, this little monster that needs to be fed X amount per month. And you had to totally. beat these targets. You had to pay the staff and you had to yeah. this investor and that investor. And you'd set it. You're almost, you would have been better off if it happened after six months when there was just the three of you. Right. Um, exactly. Yeah, we can, we can sustain this. You're talking earlier about, you know, different funds. We can sustain this next two years, yeah. right yeah. out of the Brexit thing. And it's like to bring it up to modern days over the COVID situation. I think, you know, people will have to make difficult decisions. People will have to go and go, yeah, you know what? There's, there's actually no backing out of this. We're too far gone. We're going to owe 12 months rent. We don't have it. Probably better just to start again. Yeah. So it's, it's difficult. So yeah, that decision, you made it much quicker the second time. We, we made it much quicker, but as I said, it was, I mean, it was quicker in a way because there was so many pressures and external pressures and so many things and people and processes and everything that we were responsible for. It was longer with Prowlster because almost we had the luxury of it being longer. Yeah, you know, Whereas, no. Go into your head, yes or yeah. no. Yeah, exactly. Which let people go, it, yeah. move out of the office, all of that sort of stuff. And we were still, still trying to make it work. Um, and like, I, I think, to be honest, Gary, that the moment uh, that we said this isn't going to work, when we just 
took a look around at the state of each other. Like <laughs> I, I, I'd, I'd gotten married in Prowlster. We were moving to a stage in our lives where like people were getting married, they were in serious relationships, they were trying to buy houses, they were having babies, all that sort of stuff. And we were just like, we are, we are depleted. We are, when your like creativity and passion goes, like everything else goes. Yeah, it's, really, it's, it's not an immediate thing. Mm. You, know, you don't really see, you don't look in the mirror and go, oh, my passion's down to 20%. Other people see it, and you though, your yeah, friends see it, your friends see it, you know, and you just feel burnt out. I remember after like the video scam, I was just burnt, just yeah, spent, just no energy, just had no interest completely because you give everything, you give absolutely everything, and that's part of parcel of, of running a business. Is it is your whole life. Mm -hmm. I know there's all these like mantras and methodologies for like maintaining work life balance. No, like if you can build some of that into your daily routine, that's great. But like your business there. at the start, first two or three years, the balance would be out of whack. Obviously, totally. fundamentals. And I think as you learn with age, I think we've learned it now is that, you know, you got to have your fitness, you got to have, you know, some sort of diet plan. You yeah. Got to be keeping the core, but it yeah. will take over your life. There's no two ways about it. Yeah, it's, it's you are fun. always going to be thinking about it, going to bed at night, something, you know, it can be a good thing that you're thinking or a bad thing, but it's always with you. Um, so, so yeah, I think we just looked around at each other and we just said, okay, we, we're, we're not even functioning as human beings anymore. Uh, we've done everything we could. We've done ourselves proud because we achieved so much and we did so much to try and save it. And it's just, it's not going to happen. It's, it's, there's a couple of reasons. Like I can dissect it now. In the moment, it was like, how on earth could we be left hanging after raising so much money and all these promises for this next round of investment? Brexit was a huge factor in it. Um, but now looking back, some other factors were, okay, the number one lesson I'll, I've always learned, we, we should have had a, a business designed to generate cash flow or income from the get-go. And I think that there has been so much focus on technical innovation in you know the tech startup eco culture across the world that it has been to the detriment of focusing on some of the fundamentals of building a business you know business modeling thinking about who is paying you for what and when and i think that certainly when we were going through all the accelerator programs what you're being rewarded for was disruptive innovative thinking and not necessarily thinking backed with a commercial realism you know so i think that was, we, 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 we certainly took that mindset. It was growth at yes. any cost. Yeah. And, and so much so then that we communicated that to people around us. And in terms of setting KPIs, we had the wrong KPIs. Our KPIs were about getting 100,000 people to sign up to opt in, 30 brands to sign up to opt. But it wasn't 100,000 yeah. customers buying multiple times over the year with an average order value of x you know it was just yeah. get them to sign up i and agree we... everything you said i absolutely it's the exact same mantra i was like i said it, i equated it to someone i was like would you open a shop right pay the rent get it fitted out and then your goal to be fifty thousand people to come through the door <laughs> your goal. Yeah. Like, of course it wouldn't I'm like exactly <laughs> exactly it's the same with a website it's the exact same like, no, I'm not Elon Musk. You know, there's a few Elon Musks in the world, but I think everyone is skewed towards that mentality. Mm, like, mm, build mm. something massive, make a mm. dent in the universe, and it's, it's sexual, and it's very kind of glitzy and glamour. Oh, Steve Jobs. You know, mm. not many of those on the go, I agree with you completely. You build something, <laughs> you buy it for five, you sell it for 10. Absolutely, yeah. The fundamentals never really change. I think mm. we all just lost sight of what it was. Because yeah. The multiples of tech if you make it you make it in the billions and if you mm. don't well look sure look the 50 60 million funding sure what harm you know yeah yeah it's it's i was listening to we crash and you know the story of um yeah. your man adam and, and we work and i mean there's just so many stories that are coming out and we are obviously heavily influenced by the tech startup scene in silicon valley like obviously ireland being so close and so closely connected but it's just incredible how much money is being thrown around just because somebody is charismatic or yeah, you know the power of the individual like that that narrative around one person mm. charismatic like gonna change the world get 20 billion for serviced offices effectively just making them sexy with free beer and ping pong like yeah unreal and so unfortunately you know 
along with the, the, the cult, of, cult of success and the cult of the personality when it comes to investment planning, a lot of that seeps into the kind of consciousness and certainly for younger, impressionable, kind of hungry students coming out of college um, think that they can set up a business and they very much listen in and lean to that way of thinking, you know, yes, you grow, 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 and the money will come, you know, do something really cool and disruptive and the money will come. No, sort out the money first and then. That brings it on to perfectly too. we got a question from Rory who's trying to set up his own fashion e-commerce brand and site. So what would your be advice to him is, because I think that we've just, you've just said it there, but just kind of to recap, he's like, he's just wondering, you know, how does he get going? You know, what's, what's kind of bells and whistles get set up with his own e-commerce brand? So I suppose to, to, to distinguish between manufacturing um, and sourcing your own product to sell or reselling, like really understanding that, um, is important and understanding that means understanding the costs attributed to, attributed to every stage in that journey so you know a lot of businesses don't um a lot of sorry fashion and fashion e-commerce businesses don't model manufacturing um logistics uh production e-commerce photography production um e-commerce itself sales delivery and returns they don't really stress test all of the financial levers involved in that journey. Um, and then if you are looking at a reseller or dropship model, ensuring that you really understand the profit margins and the amount of money that you have to spend to acquire a customer. And unfortunately that's, well, it depends what floats your boat, but it is a reasonably unsexy process of sitting down and looking at your finances and modeling and modeling and modeling. I think setting up a business now is really, really interesting because Two things pre-COVID had been, had been happening in Ireland. There was m so much more focus on made in Ireland and support independent and buy local. And what this means is, you know, being able to provide trust and traceability in terms of your product actually being made in Ireland. So you've got that then coupled with sustainability being a massive global conversation. And you've got, you know, big multinational high streets coming under huge fire for their manufacturing production processes. So for businesses in the fashion space, not to be, especially if you're starting one, not to be, to be building sustainability into the core of your business model um, would be completely remiss. So how, um, in how and where in your business model you intend to build sustainability in is going to be really, really important. And then with COVID right now, we're obviously seeing a spike in traffic, in video consumption, um, in uh, um, not emergency retail, but anyway, supermarket groceries, et cetera, but also hobbies. Um, and as part of hobbies, you know, you will see fashion and lifestyle coming in there to a certain degree, people making themselves feel a bit better, people having a little bit more disposable income because they're not paying crash fees, maybe they've gotten a mortgage relief, but then certainly there will be a dip. And I'm not saying I, you know, how severe it will be or how long it will be, but there will be a dip. So right now, if you're planning to set up a fashion e-commerce business, you need to be building and modeling for this dip period like crisis and scenario management to a certain degree and in a way all businesses should be doing that anyway and they don't and this has forced a lot of businesses to think about how they should do that so this is a great opportunity for a business that's just setting up mm, to right. have to do that up front yeah i think this is an unbelievable time to start which sounds bonkers when i say it to some people mm. it's an unbelievable time because if you can start it now you will kill it when things come totally. back if you can I start and make money, if you can even make a couple hundred quid a week yeah. now when things are in the absolute shitter, yeah. when it comes back again, when the good times roll again in two, three, four years, how long yeah. that be, and you need to factor in, it might be a long time. But I do think the entrepreneurs that start now will have an unbelievably higher way to chance of success because being able to do it when it's really bad will mean that when things get really good, you'll just be so far ahead of everyone. Your exact point on factoring everything in my yeah, business yeah. runs on one single spreadsheet that has every Brilliant. single cost every vat line every tax line everything Amazing. and it spits out a figure every week and that's it it's as simple as that i think people forget that because they get lost in the journey of this the glamour and the fun totally and yeah domain and <laughs> we've all yeah there. yeah sexy.com can we get you know, we all do that. Like you kind of imagine it, you sit back and you're like, oh, imagine how cool that website would be. 
but it's it's the, the horrible stuff that... no it's the, it's the bread and butter yeah it's so 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 important and when you have that nailed and you feel comfortable about it then you start going and you start looking for again lesson number two all of the off-the-shelf solutions that you can find you know don't go near i would say build your business without having to bring anybody technical into it for as long as you can and just see what you can build with the tools that are available to you because it's just phenomenal what is available now and i absolutely agree gary like i said i needed a break from running businesses um but i i do i feel there's this energy and there's this creativity in the air you've got your trading online vouchers you've got your covid business support vouchers you've got enterprise ireland doing um shopify grants you know if you want to move to shopify or upgrade to shopify plus there is grants there's funding available um the chips are down so what have you got to lose but also i think it really forces you to um really understand what a customer wants and what they need right now what are they what do they need right now what are they willing to pay for it and how are you going to communicate that to them in a as sen sensitive way possible when they're feeling as stressed as they possibly the, the most stressed that they possibly ever will if you can build and offer something that's of value to somebody right now when we do start to recover as you say like you're just going to be unlocking so many more people who are willing to pay for or invest or buy whatever it was that you had built now when things are so tough obviously doing it in the right way and doing it in, in in a sensitive way but but if you can understand people's buying habits now or consumption habits when things are so difficult it's only growing from this point so i do i i feel it's it's a stressful decision to make you know because especially now when things are kicked on a bit i should say obviously a lot of the time when you're starting off a business or going into an accelerator program you're young and you're fearless like i'm older now and i have two kids and i have a mortgage you know so i can't be as risk averse as i was i have to consider things a little bit more and right now like people are just hanging on to their jobs but interestingly when we had to wind up down, I fell pregnant. I, I was pregnant literally as we were like signing the winding down papers. Um, I was, I realized I was pregnant. And um, I couldn't get a job then straight away because okay. I needed a month or two just to be like, what? The <laughs> There's not enough sleep in the world. Like, it isn't even about sleep. It's no, just it's not. energy. Like, and oh, for rest. Go for a nice weekend somewhere. It doesn't no, like that. No. It's not like plugging in your phone charger and you suddenly come back to 99%. No. It's, <laughs> it's grieving, Gary. It's a period of grieving, you know? And, yeah, and right. yeah, soulless. And also, me, me and the sisters, we needed a bit of time to recover from each other and repair relationships. Anyway, so, so then I was visibly pregnant. So then I couldn't work. And then I had uh, Luke. And um, I just... To the easiest way for me to move back into, I moved out to Kildare as well. So there's definitely a Dublin bias. So you're moving out to Kildare. I've got a kid, I've got a failed business by me. So I had to kind of go back out on my own again anyway. Do you know, I had to start freelancing and consulting and stuff like that. So I have been doing that the last two years. And I, like in terms of consulting, like I had one like in-house consulting, very involved, very intensive for over a year. And then I do like lots of different types of shorter term projects and stuff like that. But I'm, I don't have that security that people have had. And I think I've never really had that because that's part of that like entrepreneurial way of working. Yeah. So, you know, if I did decide to, to go again at something, like I wouldn't have the, those same concerns because I'm not. What are you consulting on? Just so people can actually reach out to you if they're interested in chatting more. Yeah, brilliant. Um, digital marketing and branding and e-commerce. And I suppose specifically um, the sweet spot would be for small businesses who are looking to move into e-commerce or upscale in e-commerce. And then for bigger organizations, I would look more into and work with them more around um, content creation um, and improving uh, like aspects of the e-commerce journey. So it could be like email marketing or production or whatever. So, um, but definitely e-com and um, yeah, I think getting your business ready for e-com. It's going to be a massive wave of e-commerce. You, you touched on it there because everyone's, 
people's buying habits have changed because they've no choice. They have to order it online. They have to. People yeah. are lazy. People are like, oh, I'll just go down and do it. But yeah. now, because you have to, I think this space you're in, if I just take a punt on anything right now, yeah. Um, I think e-commerce, like and smaller e-commerce, I think it'll just become commerce. It's like phones and smartphones. Yeah. Last week as well. Phones and smartphones will just be commerce. Yes, you'll, totally. You'll, you'll be in business. And mm. being online is just a bit like having a front door. You'll just have totally. To it won't be this. So I think for people like that are listening to you or to this should like check out your stuff, just especially about that. Get the, Cause it's a different skill. It's a hugely different skill. It's not like right. buying up a shop, you know, it's very, Oh no. Oh no, no, no. And, and I like my philosophy is like, you know, when I'm actually working with people, I'm like, there's no distinction between digital and real life. They work hand in hand. It is the omni-channel experience. Everything that you do in real life, in a store, at a market, when you meet somebody, it has to mirror and reflect everything that's happening in your e-commerce environment. But I do remember years and years and years ago, getting a talk from one of the leading publishers in Ireland, um, magazine publishers, who said, digital, I'm not worried about digital. Yeah. No way. No, we're not going digital. No, we're not having a website. Absolutely not. No way. Never. It's funny. And, all the stuff you talked about, the e-commerce, about you can't do this, you can't do that. It's still the same problems. So I think we've had wave one. I think we've had the first genesis of like the iPhone one. And I think now we're going to see this burst of just how simple it's going to be driven probably by this. You know, how yes. simple it's going to be to buy online across different channels. Like Amazon are scooping everything up. So retailers now have a, they literally have no choice to either have to get so good so fast that I think it'll just unleash this wave of creativity and explosiveness around e-commerce because it's still off. It's still terrible. It's, it's, it's shocking. And you know what? That's what my point was. I hope that people really understand that they need to either embrace e-commerce for the first time or improve and invest in it because if they don't, if there are still deniers, like I don't have time for that or it's not important for my business, that's not how my customer shops, they will be the people that lose mm. when, when we go into this recession. But people who actually invest are going to be ready for when we do bounce back up. But it's just like with publishing, people who said, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to build a website digital, it's not going to affect my business, they're gone, mm. you know? So there is, I think sometimes in Ireland we can be a bit slow to kind of cotton on and it's, disgraceful how much amazon scoops up from like indigenous independent retail who just refused to kind of upscale in terms of being more tech savvy we did yeah. a story we did a, a website we're in school sorry we'll wrap up after this so the right. last yeah. question for you is yeah. recommended books if you can just think about that for a second yeah we did a, like an online business directory when we were in school for the local area and i remember we went into uh, the local retailer just like you're saying there and he was like, no one's ever going to buy a Mars bar on <laughs> Now, <laughs> I make viral videos for his off lights. <laughs> singing these stupid songs. Put them up on Facebook, getting millions of hits. Oh I'm driving God. business through that. So I always get a giggle when I see them online. Oh, hilarious. So, walk every week, we give away a book that's kind of had a... I love this. Really, yeah, it's just selfish, to be honest. I just love yeah. it book recommendations i always try to get through a couple of books a week um so for me it's just a way of getting great recommendations from people um so yeah all people have to do to win it is to tag myself and yourself and share it on social media very good brilliant um be anything it can be a fiction non-fiction anything you just had a even choice or just had an impact on you well like I'm sure you've read this and probably lots of people know about it, but in, so I don't get as much time to read anymore because I have the kids, but the one book that I did read recently and I did have to recommend it to everybody that I knew coincidentally was a book about tech, but it was just, for me, it was a great flashback and it was an amazing insight and very, very funny. So Disrupted by Dan Lyons, have you read I it? I haven't read this. I've seen it pop uh, up on a lot of lists. I haven't read it. Oh my God. It is fantastic. It's so by Dan Lyons. Okay. Yeah, it's um, disrupted. So Dan Lyons is a 50 something year old, um, I think I can't remember, Wall Street Journal reporter that, um, uh, no, I don't know where he was working actually, but some big, big title anyway, the title is going under, he needs to find a job. So he finds himself in his mid fifties applying to HubSpot for a job. So it's about what bullshittery goes on in the tech startup world but written really well because he is a writer. Yeah, um, but it's also, he's, he's talking about it from like the ageism that goes on there, you know, the cult of youth and how that is um, 
like objectified in the industry to like working for a business that sell nothing that's selling nothing about nothing um but really 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 well written exactly about this i was like i screenshot and sent to my (laughs) mate i was like look at this absolute nonsense (laughs) you know that we worked so hard and it was talking about sadly it was the person talking about getting fired they're only been there like literally two months and they were like i never felt i belonged anywhere until i came here and just people weren't working they were striving to make a difference oh my god they were selling i won't say what exactly it was it wasn't the cure for cancer it was (laughs) this software solution for x industry oh my god i love it i was terrible but it it just shows how good big tech are at, at the cult of culture and yeah. cult of like we're all in this together this is our mission yes it might be to send five thousand yeah. a week <laughs> yeah you yeah know, mission of belonging so yeah i definitely would and love. i think irish people really enjoy um those type of stories because like we are the the funniest warmest friendliest nation going but we're also like really cynical and don't oh, yeah. put up and believe in any of that bullshittery so when you read some of this stuff and you're like oh my god literally this this business is worth multiples of billions yeah. and this is their philosophy so yeah, i really enjoyed that I had a really good giggle and yeah you're right people need to kill it with the verbose linkedin essays oh my god dial it down cool. cool. <laughs> jenny where can people learn more about you um Okay, if you go to sistertheagency.com, uh, that is a site that myself and my sister Grace kind of work together on different projects. But I suppose mainly I'm on LinkedIn at Jenny McGinn and on Instagram at Jenny McGinn underscore. Underscore. Perfect. Listen, Jenny, couldn't couldn't get, get Jenny McGinn. I only realized now how far we've gone. We've gone an hour and 40, but it's been brilliant. Oh, uh, thank you so much, Jenny. And, uh, oh, thank you. I really enjoyed the episode. Thank you, Gary. Thanks a million for the chats.